Last week, we began to talk about, we opened up the book of Isaiah, and I, and I share with you that Isaiah was is one of the major prophets in the Old Testament, and he his ministry lasted through three um, kings' reigns. It was King Isaiah, King Jotham, King Ahaz, and King Hezekiah, and he was a prophet during those times. He was a minister um, to them. Um, he... he, he um, Prophesize, and I share with you that prophecy isn't always about telling the future. It's speaking to the times that are at hand as well, and, and that's what Isaiah did. And um, we are going to share. Remember last week they were on trial, but now he's talking about a, a time of peace. It's it's a futuristic vision he has, and um, of of Judah's glorious future and then he hits them where they are in the present tense as well so we're going to open up with isaiah 2 um, um, verse 1 uh, the vision that isaiah son of amos saw concerning judah and jerusalem in the last days the mountain of the lord's house will be established at the top of the mountains and will be raised above the hills all nations will stream to it so he's talking to judah and jerusalem and he's letting them know in the last days like i said just a few moments ago this is a future Aristic, uh prophecy. He's talking about uh, times to come. Amen. Um, not directly to the times you're in, but in the millennial year after the return of Jesus, what's going uh, to happen? This is the time he's talking about. And he says, the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountain um, and all the nations will stream to it. So there's this great mountain where um, where the house of the God will be and that and that's sometimes referred to as Zion and Zion is not the uh, it's not on the most physically or um, the highest mountain you know because usually when you think of greatness you would think of the highest peak or the highest mountain but Zion wasn't necessarily on the highest peak or the highest mountain but it was the highest because of what it represented. It represented Jesus and, and God and his lordship and his kingdom. And it said all nations would stream to them. So he was letting them know that it's not just going to be Judah and Jerusalem, but all nations will stream to Zion. All people, red, yellow, black and white, Jews and Gentiles, all of them are going to stream to it. And, and he said, and many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. So they're going to be seeing people on the way and they're going to say, come on, let's go to the mountain of the Lord. What you doing? Come on and go to the mountain of the Lord. Come on with me. Let's go to the mountain of the Lord. Could you imagine if we did that today as we were on our way to church? We just saw people say, come on, what you doing? You're not doing nothing. Why don't you come on to church with me? You, Hey, you over there. You're not doing nothing. Why don't you come on to church with me? But we're too busy trying to get to church so we can let people see our new suits and our new dresses so we can usher and just do the work of the uh, of the church not necessarily of the lord that we're not thinking about inviting anybody uh, along the way a a amen 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 to the house of god of Jacob. That's where they're going to, to the house of Jacob which is the Hebrew people. He will teach us about his ways so that we may walk in his paths for instruction will go out of Zion in the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So they're going there to worship him and to get instructions from him. Amen. 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 Um, you have to understand that they weren't just going to go. They were going so they could get guidance. They were going so they could get his wisdom. They were going so they could get a word so they would know how to live and how to worship him the way he deserves to be worshipped. He will settle disputes among the nations and provide arbitration for many peoples. They will turn their swords into plows and their spears into pruning knives. Nations will not take up the sword against other nations and they will never again train for war. God will take care of all disputes, all disagreements, 
all arguments. It's going to be a time of peace. Oh my Lord, how I'm looking forward to a time of peace. We have so much unrest in our nation, in this world. People hating other people because of the color of the skin, the way they live their life. If you don't do what I do or you don't believe what I believe, we have to be enemies. When, when did that happen? We could still love one another and, and, and have differing, differing opinions. Amen. We can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. But we've come to a point in our nation, in our world, that if you don't believe what I believe, then you're my mortal enemy. And I just don't believe that. Amen. We uh, God's given us free choice. Amen. God has given us free choice. He gives us the, the ability to choose him or not to choose him. So who are we to tell somebody they got to choose what we believe? Amen. That's not Bible at all. That's just what you want to believe. Amen. But God said he's going to he's gonna squash all this. He's going to end all disputes. He's going to be the arbitrator. And people won't make swords and spears no more. As a matter of fact, they'll turn their spears and, and into plow heads and, and their swords into gardening tools and, and they won't be uh, fighting one another no more. They won't be building more weapons, but they'll be building uh, uh, instruments of peace. They'll be building stuff that they can grow and plant crops and, and be the people of God that he has called them to be. I don't know about you, but I, that, that just gets me a little bit excited because, you know, there's just, uh, it just seems like some folks ain't happy unless they fight. You know, some people ain't happy unless they are. You, you know what I'm talking about? There's always that brother or sister that, you know, they just thrive on the drama. As long as there's something going on, they they love it and they're happy. And they, they try to act like they don't. I can't believe I'm going through it. But they actually really like it. Amen. But I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to a time when we can have peace. Amen. Where we can just rest in God and fellowship with one another. You know, because when we get to heaven, y'all. There ain't going to be no white section. There ain't going to be no black section. There's not going to be no Republican or no Democratic, no independent sections. We're all going to be up there together giving praise to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So this is how he starts off this chapter. These first five verses, he's giving Judah and Jerusalem a, a glimpse of their glorious future. He gets them all hyped up. He's telling them how it's going to be. He's getting them excited and then... He drops the hammer on him. <laughs> so he told him about the glorious future. But the thing about the glorious future, you're never going to reach it. You're never going to be able to enjoy it. You're never going to be able to appreciate it if you don't live the life that God has called you to live. If you don't live a holy life because we serve a God that is holy and he wants a people that are holy. Not saying you got to be perfect because nobody is perfect but Jesus, but you got to be trying to be as much like Christ as possible. So right now, this next section, he goes, in there telling them about themselves. So he gave them their, this is a glimpse of your glorious future if you live right, but this is what you're doing right now. He says, house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the Lord's light for you have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob. He said, yo, y'all tripping. You know, I laid out the law for you and you've done what you wanted to do. You haven't followed my laws. You haven't kept my commands. I want you to come back to the light because you've been walking in darkness. You've abandoned your people to do what you wanted to do. And it's time for you to come back. You, you, it, says, it says, because they are full of div divination from the east and of the fortune tellers like the Philistines, they are in a league with foreigners. Their land is full of silver and gold, and there is no limit to their treasures. Their land is full of horses, and there is no limit to their chariots. Their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. He said, your problem is, here's your problem. You've been enticed by the enemy. You've been 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 dragged to the dark side. You looked over the other side of the fence and you thought the grass was greener 
on the other side. He, you saw them, the, the, the divinations, and, and you saw the soothsayers and, and the fortune tellers, and, and you wanted that for yourself. You, you thought they had something going on. You thought they had a power that you could tap into them that you didn't have with me. You, you saw their silver and their gold. You saw their horses and their chariots. You saw their wealth, and you wanted what they had, but you didn't realize that you were already rich in what I had to offer you. You didn't want for nothing. I gave you everything you need, but you saw what they had, and but then you wanted it, so you started to do the things they did to get what they got, but that's not what I called you to do, and we can't look at them like looking at them like, I can't believe they did that. I can't believe they're doing that. When we do the same thing, we look at our co-workers, and they got a new house, and so we want to get a new house. They got a new car, so we want to get a new car. We They got a new Fendi bag, so we want to get a new Fendi bag. Oh, don't look at me. Don't look at that screen and that tone of voice. You know exactly what I'm talking about. They got some cold horns, so you want some cold horns. They got some red bottoms, so you want some red bottoms. You know, you saw what your neighbor got, and you want it too. You know what I'm talking about. Your, na- your neighbor got a new John Deere, and you wanted John Deere. What you need a John Deere for? You, you, you ain't even got a fourth of an acre of land, but you want a John Deere. I'm speaking to myself because I had to have a riding lawnmower. I bought me a riding lawnmower, and by the time I was, uh, it wasn't zero turn. I couldn't afford that at the time. But but by the time I did my three point turn and was going the other way, I could have actually been done cutting my grass with a regular lawnmower. But praise be to God, I retired from grass cutting, and my neighbor cuts my grass now. My neighbor's son, and he does an excellent job. But anyway. Y'all know what I'm talking about, you know. So, so they got in trouble because they were for they were yearning for the things that 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 the, that the foreigners had, that the Babylonians had, that the Assyrians had, and they wanted those things for themselves. But God called them to be separate. He called them to be holy. But they chose to go a different route. They even desired their idols, the things made from hands and the things made with fingers. What are you going to do with an idol? I don't know about you, but I don't want a god that I can hold in my hand. I don't want that type of God in my life. I don't want a God that I can place in my pocket. Because you know what? If I can place my God in my pocket, if I can carry my God around in my hand, what is that God going to do for me when I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place? What is a uh, what is a molded piece of metal going to do for me when my rent is due? What is a carved up, uh, uh, shaved piece of wood going to do for me when my body is aching and my relationship is falling apart? What is an idol going to do for me when I'm down to my last dime, when my money is funny and my change is strange, when I'm unemployed and and my wife's about to leave me? What is an idol going to do for me? I need a God that's bigger than my problems and an idol is not that. I never understood worshiping something that don't breathe, don't talk, can't touch you, can't wrap its arm around you, can't save you, can't bleed for you. What are you going to do with that? Amen. And don't just get it twisted. It ain't just things that you put in your pocket. Some of y'all I idolize your car. Some of y'all idolize your football, your basketball team. Some of y'all idolize your girlfriends or your wives or your husbands. Some of y'all idolize your grandchildren. Come on now. Anything you put before God is an idol. Amen. So we got to be careful when it comes to those things. So, so God says, um, God says, so humanity is brought low because of what you've done and man is humbled. Do not forgive them. Go into the rocks and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and from his majestic splendor. Human pride will be humbled and the loftiness of man will be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted on that day. So he's saying because of what you've done, because of how you acted, it's on. You are going to have to face the 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 um the the results of your actions the consequences of your actions i tell my children the, my my birth children and my students at school there are consequences to your actions you will either have good consequences or you will have bad consequences if you do the right thing there's going to be good consequences if you do the wrong thing there are going to be bad consequences and jerusalem is about to suffer some bad consequences if they don't get it together he said man will be humbled amen they will be brought low One thing that stands in our way more than anything is our pride and thinking we're more than what we are. That is an ugly thing to God. He doesn't like our 
pride, our loftiness, our haughtiness, thinking we're better than someone else. How are you going to be a Christian and act like you better than someone else? Amen. That's not the God we serve. That's not how Jesus walked this earth when he was here. He he went to the to the homeless. He went to the hurt and, and despair. He went to the widow. He, he went to those suffering because that's where he was needed. Amen. It's sick people that need a doctor. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Amen. So he went where he was needed. Amen. So human pride is the enemy, man. Man, you got to stay away from that with all you got. He said, for a day belonging to the Lord of hosts is coming against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up. It will be humbled. He said, it's coming. God is coming to tear it all down. And then he just breaks it down what he's going to tear down. Check it out. Check it out. Against all the cedars of Lebanon. That's talking about pride, lofty and lifted up. Against all the oaks of Bashan. He's talking about pride and loftiness. Against all the high mountains, against all the lofty hills, against every high tower, against every fortified wall, against every ship of Tarshish and against every splendid a uh, splendid sea vessel. So human pride will be brought low and the loftiness of man will be humbled and the Lord alone will be exalted on that day. Idols, the idols will vanish completely. Idols will vanish completely. So anything that is high and lifted up is referring to um, like the Asherah poles, the Asherah poles that were high and lifted up. They were the high and lofty places. Uh, um, they tried to be higher than what God was and all those things that he was going to tear them down because people were proud about doing the wrong thing. It's one thing to have pride, which isn't good, but it's another thing to have pride in doing the wrong thing. And they were proud. They were conceited. They were stuck on themselves because they thought they was doing something powerful when all they were doing was the opposite of what God had called them to do, y'all. So he said, I'm bringing it all down. The Lord's day is going to all come tumbling down. The Lord will be exalted and you will see that I am who I said I am. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It is all coming down. It said people will go into caves into the rocks and the holes in the ground, away from the terror of the Lord and from his majestic splendor when he rises to terrify the earth. On that day, people will throw their silver and gold idols, which they made to worship to the moles and the bats. They will go into caves of the rocks. They will go into the crevices and the cliffs, away from the terror of the Lord and from his majestic splendor when he arises to terrify the earth. So they know they wrong. So what they gonna do? They gonna go run and hide. It's like when the, when the teenagers, when the parents are out, you know what I'm talking about? When parents go out of town and, and the kids say, I'm going to throw a party and they have all these people over their house and they doing stuff they ain't supposed to do. And then all of a sudden mom and dad come home unexpectedly and everybody runs out the house. They throwing out the drugs. They throwing out the liquor. They throwing out all the bad stuff. So mom and dad can't see what they was doing. This is what it's going to be like when God comes to get things right and the people who aren't living right, they're going to try to hide from God. They're going to try to throw out their idols in a dark place so God can't see them which I don't understand because if you don't know by now that God knows everything, sees everything, he can't hide from God. He made everything, created everything. So how you going to hide from God on his earth? He created that crevice. He created that crave. He created that hole. So how you going to hide from God? You can't hide from God. That's like, why do we do things thinking that God don't see us? Amen. God sees everything we do. He knows everything. He knows our thoughts. Amen. That's why you got to guard your mind. I was talking to Noah about this the other day. You know, you can't let everything seep into your mind and start thinking about it because when it seeps into your mind and you start thinking about it, the next thing you do, you're not just going to be thinking about it. You're going to be doing it. Amen. Amen. But you can't hide from God. The best thing to do is just try to do your best. Live the life that he called you to live and then you don't have to worry about nothing. You don't have to hide anything. Amen. Because if you make a mistake, God knows where your heart is. Amen. He knows you're not trying to get over. He knows you're not being haughty and, and, and lofty and prideful. Amen. So you got to get your mind right. Amen. And then you don't have to worry about hiding from God. Amen. Because you can't. Amen. You can't hide from It's God, y'all. Come on now. That's one game of hide and seek you're going to lose because he's going to find you every single time. You know, you're going to be, you might as well be like that little kid, you know, who goes like this. 
and thinks that you can't see him because he can't see you. Because that's basically what it looks like when someone's trying to hide from God. That's like Adam and Eve in the garden after they messed up. They tried to hide in some bushes from God. As if God, even though he said, where are you, Adam and Eve? He knew where they were. Come on now. He's God. He made the garden. You can't hide from God. But let me read this last verse as we wrap things up. He says, put no more trust in man who has only the breath in his nostrils. What is he really worth? So he ends this by saying, not only do you need to check yourself as far as your pride, not only do you need to check yourself in regards to the idols in your life, but you need to check yourself in regards to who you put your trust in. You know, many people put their trust in man, woman, human, human, who humanity, excuse me, and then when that person fails them, they all broken, busted, and disgusted. Amen. You can't put your trust in man because man is going to fail you every single time. Probably not purposely, sometimes maybe purposely, but man is frail. We are fragile people. We make mistakes. Don't put your trust, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying don't trust anybody. Y'all got to hear what I'm saying because you have to trust people in general. You got to trust your husband. You got to trust your wife. You got to trust your kids that they're going to do the right thing. That's not the type of trust. I'm talking about putting faith in man that should be in God. You don't put trust and faith in man that belongs to God. Amen. Because God will never fail you. That's why we can trust him. That's why we can put our faith in him because he's never going to fail us. Now, some of us believe that God has failed us in way, one way, shape, or form. But just because he didn't do what you wanted to do the way you wanted him to do it doesn't mean he failed. He just knew that you weren't ready for what you asked him for. Come on, somebody. He doesn't always give us what we want, but he always gives us what we need. Amen. So don't put your faith in man. Put your faith in God. And I guarantee you that everything will work out for your good. Amen. Amen. Give God a round of applause. We serve a good, good God and a great, great father. So I'm going to ask you guys a few questions.